Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Zoback, and I'm happy to be moderating this session on natural gas and the energy transition. We're going to start with a question on the role of natural gas today and the future of natural gas in a decarbonizing energy world. And we have an absolutely wonderful panel with diverse backgrounds from a disciplinary point of view and also diverse sort of geographic perspective. Uh, we have Sarah Ortwein, the CEO of XTO, one of the, the major producers of unconventional natural gas in both North America and Argentina. We have Frank Mele from Azimuth Cap Capital in, in, in Calgary. And we have David Carroll, president of the uh, Gas Technology Institute and the immediate past president of the International Gas Union. So I want to tackle this question sort of geographically first. So I'd like to start in the United States, and then we'll sort of expand out from there. So uh, Sarah, could you sort of give us a perspective on where you see natural gas today, and, and where is it going? Well, first off, thank you, Mark. It's great to, uh, to be here. ExxonMobil and XTO have had a long partnership, some 15 years or more, um, with Stafford University, first as part of GSEP, and most recently as a founding member of the uh, Stanford Strategic Energy Alliance. So we've worked together for many years on, on research that's, that's really critical for what we're talking about here, and that's, that's growing energy resources to be able to meet the growing demand, but also at the same time deal with the dual challenge of protecting our environment as we grow those resources. So uh, appreciate being here to be able to talk about this. Um, you know, I think all of us that are here today realize that there's a tran an energy transition that's underway. And whether you're representing the oil and gas industry, the nuclear industry, or renewables, whether you're part of industry, academia, NGOs, all of us have a very important role that we play in making sure that we're developing solutions for the future. We're focused on solutions that are affordable and that are scalable, and that's, I think, where natural gas really comes in and plays a strong role for us. It has a critical role uh, to play. The abundance of affordable, very versatile, and reliable natural gas brings a lot of benefit uh, for both consumers and for the environment here in the US, but also around the world. So I'll just start with the economic benefits um, you know, that we're seeing as a direct result of natural gra gas growth. You, many of you know over the past decade, the shale revolution here in the US has really unlocked huge supplies of energy that we originally thought was, was inaccessible. And, and it really hasn't been very distant past where we were having a lot of conversation about scarcity and shortages of energy. But the growth in unconventionals and in unconventional gas has really shifted, shifted that paradigm dramatically. And now, you know, I would say that natural gas is really a a pillar of US economic growth and strength. Jobs are being created. Uh, the manufacturing, domestic manufacturing industry is flourishing, and energy costs for consumers are quite low. A lot of that because of the growth in natural gas. For example, low cost shale gas has spurred over $200 billion in chemical manufacturing investments. And ultimately, that's gonna support a growth in jobs of probably about 785,000 uh, jobs. Average energy costs fell 34% between 2008 and 2016 from a record high to a record low energy expenditure share in less than a decade. So significant benefits that we're seeing and it hasn't been very long where we were talking about LNG import terminals, and now we're talking about LNG export terminals. And in fact, in 2017, we became a net exporter of natural gas. So a lot has, has changed. The environmental benefits are also substantial. And um, you know, just replacing coal with natural gas and power generation 
is, is really the most significant. Um, and typically the, the lowest cost option that we've got today to reduce greenhouse gas em emissions. In fact, when you look at natural gas and power generation, it emits up to 60% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than coal when it's used for power generation. So I know that there's a lot of folks here and, and many of you all in the audience that are probably focused on renewables. And clearly we agree that renewables are gonna play a key role and a growing role as we look to, to uh, make this transition and, and meet growing demand. But as we've seen here in California and in other areas, natural gas is very clear and necessary partner that complements the intermittent renewables such as wind and solar as we're looking towards generating reliable power. Um, it's, it's also an effective supplement to battery storage. And that's currently cost prohibitive, but clearly this is an area where a lot of research is going on and we're all monitoring that research. So, so as we look forward, you know, I think it's important to, uh, to look at, at natural gas as really helping us bridge to the future and, and provide that, that reliable energy source that is, is becoming part of the, the important growth, uh, growth engine for the future. Thank you. Frank, Canada is both similar to and uh, different from the United States. Can you uh, give us uh, your view from your perspective as, as someone in, in, in finance, as well as representing all of Alberta and all of Canada? You bet, you bet. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm also pleased and very honored to be here today on behalf of Azimuth Capital. Um, I've been here uh, two weeks ago. We were sponsors of the Natural Gas Initiative, so we're very honored to be associated with uh, the university here. So I'm going to provide my comments both from a Canadian perspective and then from an Alberta perspective, uh, the province that I currently live in. Before getting into that, I want to set some context here. Canada, as you may know, we're, we're the 38th largest country with a population of about 37 million. That compares to the American, America here, third largest with a population nine times larger at around 377 million. Notwithstanding that uh, small population base, Canada is actually the sixth um, consumer, largest consumer of natural gas. More importantly, we're the fourth largest producer of natural gas. We are very blessed with respect to the abundance of natural gas in Canada as a whole. Having said that, what's somewhat unique about Canada relative to um, the states and in particular Alberta is that we're also blessed with hydro. You may not know that we're actually the second largest hydroelectricity producer in the world, only behind China. We currently produce about 400 terawatt hours of electricity versus China at 1,200. So with that large resource, when you look at Canada, in effect, we've actually been decarbonizing our fuel source with a renewable for, century, for yeah, centuries, given the fact that we're, we have hydro. So right now, hydro plays a predominant role with respect to providing us hydroelectricity. Having said that, we, all, we also realize the abundance of natural gas, and this will play a key role with respect to Canada going forward. Now let's look at Alberta. Alberta is a little more typical to many other um, developing worlds. Right now, 50% of, of our electricity is actually fueled by coal, followed closely by natural gas at 40%. And from a hydro perspective, it's actually only 3%. So relatively speaking, hydro is not a big fuel source in Alberta as it is for the balance of the country. With this abundance of natural gas in Alberta, Alberta has taken an initiative very recently with respect to phasing out coal-fired power plants um, in the province. A couple of years ago, the current government um, instituted new legislation called Climate Leadership Plan. And you'll hear that often when you come to Canada and Alberta. We are leaders when it comes to regulation, not only of natural gas, but with all resources. So under this Climate Leadership um, Program, 
One of, one of the main mandates under there is the phasing out of coal-fired power plants by 2030. Phasing out coal for natural gas and renewables. The renewable component is going to be upwards of 30%. Now, we've got abundance of natural gas. The renewable component is going to be a challenge, no different than the, um, a lot of other jurisdictions, countries, when they're looking to move to renewables. The main renewable source in Alberta is actually wind. So when you think of wind relative to providing us power, there are the three challenges primarily are geography, timing, and economics. So from a geography perspective, the wind farms in Alberta are located in southern Alberta. Hydro, uh, primary source of, primary user of hydro or of electricity is the industrial, uh, is in, in industrial, and so industrial is primarily located in central and northern Alberta. So we've got the wind located in southern Alberta, but unfortunately the use of that is located central and northern Alberta. So we've got a geography challenge that faces Alberta. We also have a timing challenge that faces Alberta, and that deals with the notion that peak demand is generally during the day. Industrial users are generally on during the day. Peak supply of wind in Alberta in the southern corridor is actually at night. So we've got this timing disconnect. And then, of course, the economics with this abundance. Natural gas is actually cheaper than, than wind right now. So as we look to the future, from a national perspective, in my view, we have actually been ahead of the curve with respect to decarbonizing our fuel source, given the abundance of hydro we have. In Alberta, we have now legislation that effectively will look to use this abundance of natural gas to phase out coal plants. Um, the renewable component will have some challenges, and the reality is it'll be a hybrid model as we move forward, looking to blend renewables with some storage and natural gas. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Well, I can't think of anyone uh, better qualified to kind of give us a global perspective. We talked a lot about fuel switching yesterday, especially from, from coal to natural gas, and, and the fact that, in fact, not as much fuel switching is happening as we might like. And David's got a, a tremendous um, perspective, both, both uh, as the CEO of uh, GTI and, and your service as the president of the International Gas Union. So can you sort of broaden the perspective, broaden our perspective globally, and then perhaps also you know, comment on this, this challenge of um, fuel switching when the evaluation is done narrowly on a, a dollar per B, BTU basis in much of the developing world? Sure, be happy to, Mark. And, uh, Pleased to be with all of you this afternoon and to share the stage with my distinguished colleagues and yourself, Mark, of course. And as, as GTI, we're, we're proud members of Stanford's Natural Gas Initiative and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you and, and many of you in the audience to help prepare the companies of today to meet the energy challenges of the future. I'll speak for a few moments uh, from the perspective of my recently concluded role of the president of the International Gas Union, which is a 91 country global association that's really dedicated to uh, promoting the economic and technical uh, advancement of the global gas industry. And my term ended at the uh, World Gas Conference, which took place in Washington, D.C. at the end of June. And there's, there was a report that was put together by IGU by SNAM, which is an Italian energy company, and BCG, Boston Consulting Group, that took a look at the global dynamics of, uh, of gas. And uh, perhaps I'll just cite a few uh, takeaways from that. I think a lot of that supports what we've heard the last couple days, uh, but also some of it might run counter <laughs> to some of the rhetoric that we've heard uh, with some of the speakers. So. Um, three takeaway themes from the, uh, from the report, high level. Number one, substantial global gas growth. And I'll get to that in a minute. The second is that the production growth really came from established players. The US of the world, the, uh, the uh, Australias, the Russias, and so forth. 
not so much the emerging uh, countries, over the last year. And uh, the last key takeaway was this phenomenal growth of liquefied natural gas, or LNG, uh, continues. So uh, first of all, year over year, 2017, last year, natural gas grew 3.7%, more than double its average over the last decade. So something's going on out there that there's an uptake of, of gas. I'm going to give you three other numbers. Somebody grew at 15%, some region grew at 6 and some, uh, some region lost uh, a little uh, ground and, and shrunk by a percent and a half in terms of their consumption. China, 15%. Um, in fact, it represented one-third of the global growth last year in terms of natural gas and fully 50% of all the increased LNG driven by policies, uh, uh, driven certainly by the desire to clean their air, which I'll get to in a moment, and, uh, and uh, really just a, a substantial commitment to natural gas. I just came back from Shanghai um, just uh, two days ago at, at the GasX conference, and I know our, our gentleman from China said that uh, they're a partner and not a competitor, but let me tell you, they're really competitive in natural gas. They put a list up there. They're now number three in the world for consumption. They've already targeted when they're going to pass Russia in consumption, and they're thinking about when they're going to pass the U.S. in consumption. <laughs> That's a stat that they want to try to, uh, 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 try to take advantage of. The 6% growth was Europe. Despite all the rhetoric about companies running away from gas and, and so forth, Europe's demand actually increased substantially. And uh, driven by a couple things. One, colder weather. Second, an economic recovery. And third, a little bit of coal to gas switching. So I think what Europe is finding as the economy recovers that you can't really run your industrial plants on wind. And you can't warm yourself during the winters with the sun. So we've seen substantial growth in uh, year-over-year -year growth in Europe. And frankly, that continues a three-year trend of growth. Uh, I'll get to your point about coal switching. It was the US that actually declined last year by a percent and a half, affected really by, there's a little blip in, in pricing of natural gas, and it caused a, uh, some reversion back to coal electricity generation instead of natural gas. So again, China continues to lead a, uh, the pack um, Europe substantial growth, which, by the way, was completely supplied, all that increase, by Russian pipeline gas, which is interesting given some of the rhetoric uh, about that. Um, do I have another minute? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I told you I wouldn't filibuster, but I think I'm doing it. Uh, China and India, back in 2000, had the same consumption of gas, 27 billion uh, cubic meters, the same. Uh, China is now four times larger than India in terms of its consumption, and 10 times greater than it was back in 2000. And, and really, it was their policy to establishing targets, uh, to providing preferential pricing to uh, cities to build out their infrastructures for distribution uh, within cities and opening their markets to new investments. So policies mattered a great deal in that case, and I think will continue to do so. And cities are important because 90% of all projected gas growth globally in the coming 25 years is going to take place in urban environments. So in order for this to, uh, uh, to take place, we're going to need to continue to focus on safer and reliable operations, cost reductions, enhancing access to gas in a variety of ways, and, uh, and of course, working to minimize the environmental footprint of gas as well. So I think maybe I'll stop there and... Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're getting some good questions from the audience, and we'll, we'll turn to those in a moment. Um, I'd like to take a couple minutes to let each of the panelists comment on the issue of the environmental impacts of natural gas. Obviously, at the development level, there's sort of a, a fear of fracking. Uh, there's a, um, proposition on the ballot in Colorado uh, next Tuesday that may largely shut down operations in, what, 85% of the available areas for development. 
And uh, you know, public concern about development is, is really um, uh, very you know intense in some places. And and more generally, there's a, also a concern about methane leakage through the natural gas distribution system and whether or not some of the benefit of fuel switching is being um, offset by methane uh, leakage, which are, is a very potent greenhouse gas. So uh, Sarah, starting with you, could you just sort of comment on these issues and, and what steps are being taken where you think you know, the attention really needs to be you know, paid to, to, to address the, the most important aspects of those problems? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And, and I, I think these are very fundamental and important questions, and they're certainly ones that at ExxonMobil and XTO, um, we're very focused on. And as we've all talked about, there's a lot of benefits to natural gas, but we also believe that those benefits can be expanded. And um, you know, it's, it's important. Our, our products are gonna provide the foundation. They have provided the foundation for the necessities that we have in modern life. They support the rising populations around the world and, and really a growing middle class. And so we've got to continue to provide uh, affordable energy. And as I said before, and I think we've all said, natural gas is a key, key role in that. Um, and it's also a pathway to lower CO2 emissions and overall uh, ambient air pollution. But, but there is additional work that we can do, and it's all part of the dual challenge of providing that affordable resource, that energy resource, but also improving on and minimizing the environmental impact that we've got. So we, we've chosen, and I can tell you what we're doing and what we're encouraging others in our industry to do, we've chosen to face that head on. Um, and we've, we've made commitments uh, to continue our longstanding uh, commitment to minimize uh, emissions, but, but uh, made further commitments um, from that standpoint. In September of 2017, last year, we announced a, an enhanced methane emissions reduction program, and quite comprehensive. It's underpinned by research, by testing new technology, and that really is the backbone of a, of a broader, more comprehensive initiative that includes training, it includes equipment phase out, and uh, probably most importantly, new design improvements in facilities, both uh, existing facility retrofits as well as, as new facilities. And specifically, um, just a few things that we're doing, we're phasing out all of our high bleed pneumatic devices across all of our, our uh, operations over a three year period. And, and I'm really pleased to say that already within a year, we've, we've uh, phased out two thirds of those. So, you know, that's a, that's a step we're taking. We've implemented an enhanced leak detection and repair program that's helping us in identifying components that have a potential for leakage. And, and then we, we are also at the same time implementing new technology which shows Great promise for making the, the task of identifying, doing the leak detection and repair more robust, uh, more rapid, more cost effective, and, uh, and working on things like the mobile methane challenge that, that, um, that Stanford has led to identify what some of those technologies can be. Um, it, these are voluntary efforts. We're taking those along with other operational improvements. And just, just the steps we've taken to date have resulted since 2016 in an overall reduction of about 4% in methane emissions or, or about 7,200 metric tons of methane uh, across the uh, XTO energy operations to date. We're high grading facilities. In April, we started up a new facility in, in, in the Delaware Basin in New Mexico that incorporates low emissions technologies, and it's gonna serve as a model that we can build upon for our future, future developments. And in May, we went further and announced, ExxonMobil announced further greenhouse gas reduction measures. We've committed to a 15% reduction in methane emissions and a 25% reduction in flaring by 2020. All of these are steps that we feel like are necessary and important in moving forward with natural gas and, and doing our part in making sure that we're reducing our environmental 
footprint. But beyond that, we're partnering with our industry peers, we're working with policymakers to make sure that we are advocating for sound environmental policies that can one, generate sustainable results, but also without stifling in innovation and without hampering development. And I think those are very important points. As an example of that, ExxonMobil is one of eight global energy companies that supported uh, that have, are supporting guiding principles on methane reduction. We joined our industry peers and NGOs like the Environmental Defense Fund to design those principles to really do three things. One, continue continually reduce methane emissions. Uh, two, improve the accuracy of data that's, that's collected on methane emissions, and three, to advocate for sound policy and regulation on methane emissions, which we think is important as well. Another example, in September we joined the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which is a vi voluntary initiative that is in, involves 13 of the largest oil and gas producers in the world. And we're working collaboratively with this group towards solutions to mitigate the risks of climate change. And we're also a founding member of API's environmental partnership. And again, focused on reducing emissions from methane emissions as well as VOC uh, emissions. So one of the things, one of the key roles that we're taking on across all these initiatives is to encourage others in the industry to do the same. It's going to take all of us to make a difference and to continue to make the difference uh, that we've been moving forward to. So that's just a few examples of how I think we can take natural gas and, and actually make it even more, uh, even less impactful to the environment than it is today as we move forward. Frank, in Canada, has, you know, we, we see Alberta as uh, place with a rather robust regulatory system? Has, has this been dictated? Is it happening um, spontaneously by industry? What's, what's happening there? It's, it's a combination of both, Mark. Um, again, both Canada and Alberta are leaders when it comes to regulation of natural gas. Um, you know, it starts with Canada. We are a signature to the Paris Accord, um, you know, and we are actually following through with the Paris Accord. Uh, unlike uh, some other countries that have either <laughs> pulled out or effectively are, are ignoring the Paris Accord. So with respect to that, um, we have implemented carbon taxes both federally and provincially. As Peter McKay referenced yesterday, it is a controversial issue, but um, from a provincial perspective, we do have uh, carbon taxes in place. They've been in place for the last couple of years. Currently, we are, we're imposing a $30 per ton uh, tax on, on carbon emissions. When it comes to um, fugitive gases, again, we have very tight legislation. Um, currently, we have legislation that actually requires us to um, reduce the fugitive gases by 45% by the year 2025. In Alberta, we actually have draft legislation in place right now. It's known as Directive 60 which effectively mandates uh, companies, and depending on what facilities they have and infrastructure, they're required to do um, a survey of that equipment either once or three times a year. So that's, that's pretty frequent, but more importantly, to the extent that they actually um, detect any methane leakage, they actually have to uh, remediate that leakage within 30 days. So tight, time tight timeline with respect to uh, frequencies of survey, but then even tighter, 30 days from which to remediate any detection of that leakage. So that's legislation. In terms of the industry itself, very similar to what's happening here in the US, there's been associations um, that have effectively volunteered to get together. The main one in Canada is known as PTAC, Petroleum Technology um, Association of Canada. Um, and effectively, this is an association that um, combines industry participants, some of the largest producers in Canada. It has individuals from the regulatory bodies, both federally and provincially uh, within this organization. Um, it has academia. We have some 
very bright researchers from the University of Calgary, one of the, one of the, one of the biggest universities in Alberta that focuses on, on energy per se. And then we also, it's also complemented by talented, bright individuals that have expertise in this area. And two of the mandates that they're doing specific to methane leakage is they're, they're doing a fair amount of research with respect to remote sensing of, of of um, methane leakage. And I know there's a lot of research dollars going into this, and I understand even Stanford may has some research with respect to remote sensing. So that's also being done up in Canada from an in collaboration perspective. In addition, PTAC's also um, focusing on mounting sensors on trucks that will effectively monitor. They'll be driving up the highway, secondary highways, and essentially looking for methane leakage. So we have the legislation in place that's very tight, and then we actually have industry trying to complement that legislation by effectively putting uh, research dollars on effectively sensors associated with that. So a lot of legislation looking at this issue. The one thing that I just kind of want to bring to the audience attention is generally when people think of legislation, regulations, they, they perceive it as a burden on, on the company. You know, you gotta hire accountants, you gotta hire engineers, and you, you know, worst of all, you gotta hire lawyers to ensure that you're complying with this, with this legislation. But the thing you need to understand, and we at Asmuth Capital, a private equity firm, when you take a look at this, it's actually positive for the company. For instance, we have looked at studies, ESG, uh, Environment, Social, and Governance, and if companies actually pay attention to this regulation, they can actually, there's a direct correlation to an alpha, gen, alpha generation, i.e. stock performance, upwards of 4.5%. If you look at methane leakage, the studies indicate that if you actually focus on this, you potentially have an alpha generation of 4% was associated with this. So if you're a multi-billion dollar company, generating a 4% incremental return will actually pay for accountants, you know, the engineers, well, maybe a few lawyers. Um, but the bottom line is endorsing legislation is actually positive benefit to producers that actually follow through with respect to ensuring that they're complying with it because it, it actually benefits their own stock performance relative to you know, this perception that maybe they're benefiting the environment, which they are, but you can be selfish too and benefit the company and your shareholders as well. That's, that's an interesting message which I uh, hope gets out to the, to the operator yeah. community. David, let me, let me change the question a little bit for you. Um, uh, in terms of the, the meeting the Paris Accords, countries around the world have signed these accords some countries, um, India, for example, said, well, yeah, we've signed the Paris Accords and we're not building any more coal plants after 2030. And they were very kind of proud of that. And I thought, that's nothing to be proud of. That's another 12 years of building coal burning power plants. Um, have you seen any enhanced utilization of natural gas globally tied to the commitments countries have made to uh, abide by the Paris Accords? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Although it, it was surprising when you look at the INDCs, the individual commitments, if you will, that countries are making, that it was a mi minority of those reports that actually um, referenced natural gas as part of their solution, even though in practice uh, that's what's happening uh, in many, many cases. And uh, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the role of gas and the role of renewables in the energy electricity generation, uh, which is very important. But we also have to realize that natural gas fuels an entire economy, right? Uh, from chemicals manufacturing to fertilizer to uh, uh, heating homes and providing heat for industrial processes and so forth, which is a big part of this. There was a reference yesterday to the University of Chicago back to China again, but it failed to deliver the punchline. And it was, uh, I'll go back to Beijing again, but they've dashed to gas in Beijing. They have uh, shut down coal plants and converted to, um, to natural gas. And the punchline is that the U of C study now projects that the average Beijing citizen will live two and a half years longer because of the cleaner air. Mm -hmm. So you take 22 million people times two and a half years and it's more than 50 million years of productive life 
that we'll get from that city. And I think it's very powerful, and especially in the developing world, uh, that's, I, I think natural gas is playing a key role to both address environmental concerns, uh, but also to improve quality of life. I, I was once talking about the enhanced use of gas in China, and someone said, well, they're not, it's not for CO2, it's for public health and air pollution. And I said, so what? You know, if they're doing the right thing, yeah. the order of their priorities is really unimportant, and it's good to see they're doing the right thing. But we're and, seeing coal switching, you know, across, uh, fuel, uh, fuel, 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 fuel switching from coal to um, gas across the way. I want to ask a, a short question uh, to Frank, and that is, uh, what has been the impact of the, of the carbon tax on the natural gas industry in Alberta, at least so far? And then I, I have a question for the entire panel, but Frank, uh, what's, what's happened there? Well, I'll say when it was first introduced, it's a tax. Most people don't react positively to taxes, so I would say there was a reluctance, the fact that it was a tax. Having said that, the industry has um, e effectively incorporated this in all their economics today. Um, it has not slowed down the industry at all. Um, it has effectively been welcomed to this point in time uh, reluctantly, but um, in terms of it having an impact it has, it's had a marginal impact. I would say commodities have had a bigger impact with respect to the pace of drilling versus uh, this carbon tax. There, there's a question from someone in the audience that I think speaks to an issue that everyone's uh, concerned with, and that is, as we switch from a, a, a dirty fossil fuel to a clean fossil fuel, we're still using fossil fuels. And by, is the enhanced, you know, so is, is natural gas gonna be a transitional fuel? or is it gonna remain a foundational fuel that's still contributing uh, greenhouse gases? And so, uh, and there's, there, you know, there's a sense that, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing, but we may be locked in to not doing the best thing. So would you share your perspectives on sort of, you know, the, the use of natural gas at, you know, in decarbonization from, you know, from a, really a global perspective? Um, are we eventually going to be, you know, capturing the CO2 from natural gas and making natural gas carbon free? Where, where are things going? I'll take a start here. All right. Uh, from our perspective, generally speaking, it's going to be the economics that dictate what happens with respect to natural gas, coal, renewables. It, it fundamentally does go down to costs. So as we look at today, as we look at the medium term, as we look at the long term, it is our view that natural gas will continue to play a role with respect to being a, a fuel of, of, of choice um, as the population grows and as the standard of living in developing countries um, increases. So from our perspective, we do see natural gas potentially tapering off. Uh, going forward, but until renewables can be stable, until renewables can be delivered on a cost-efficient basis as natural gas, governments are forced to provide for their citizens. They're going to be forced to provide it in a cost-efficient manner, and you know, at least now, to medium term, natural gas will continue to play uh, a prominent role with respect to that. You know, so, and I'd uh, add to that. Um... You know, as you look out for the foreseeable future, demand for energy is going to continue to grow. And, and our perspective would be we're going to need all kinds of energy. We're going to need growth in renewables. We're going to need natural gas. And we're going to continue to need, uh, need oil as well and coal. But, but natural gas is going to gradually replace uh, coal because it's cleaner burning, because it's abundant, because it's affordable. But we're going to need all kinds of energy. And, um, and it's going to be important that we continue to develop the technology to minimize the environmental impact, uh, but bring energy in all forms forward in an affordable manner so that, so that we can continue to see the benefits around the world that we've seen here from the abundance of energy that we have. David, we'll give you the, the last word. Yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think it's part of the energy mix today and also part of the energy, energy mix in the future. It's got to be. But uh, you know, energy companies are going to have to change their stripes a bit and change their product uh, mix. And one thing I'll just put out there is that gas has a renewable story as well. There's the biomass-generated gas from biomethane or other biomass sources. 
There's power to gas by spinning wind, windmills to produce hydrogen and so forth. And by doing that, you still give yourself that resiliency in an energy system, uh, the ability to respond to peaks and valleys and demand. And uh, it really helps to make a robust, secure, and resilient system. So there's an element, even in the gas sector, that uh, has a, a very large renewable piece as well. Thank you. Well, please uh, join me in, in thanking the panel.